Okay, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Global Correlations. And today we're going to examine how America can make peace in the Middle East. This is not an easy question. It seems to be more complicated every day, but for really complicated things, uh, we talked to Carl Baker. Uh, and he is a senior advisor at Pacific Forum. We're going to talk about American foreign policy in, in a chaotic framework. Wow, Carl, are you up to it? I don't know, Jay. Uh, it's a it's a tough it's a tough tough problem to solve, and you know by framing it as how the Americans or how the United States can make peace sort of hints at part of the problem. I think because that's always been the go to solution when it comes to to the Middle East, specifically Israel. That the United States is sort of seen as as the global power that can solve all problems, or at least gets gets nominated as the uh, as the prime mover in solving those problems and i think today that's becoming more and more of a question of whether this is still the case and and we see the fragmentation within the us itself of of how do we deal with this problem and then and then you see the rest of the world looking at it saying oh how many double standards can you violate this time america you know so i think it's it's a big problem it's a big challenge and and there's no there's obviously no easy solutions here. What are we looking for? Let's let's be optimistic for a minute. When we say, you know, how America uh, can make peace, what what is peace exactly? Well, yeah, I think that's I think that's a, a fair question because because what is peace in the Middle East? It's people not killing each other. Maybe that's that's kind of the bottom line. But maybe let's let's start by by thinking about where the United States wants to end. This, I mean, what's what's the end state that that the Americans want? And to me, it's to build a stronger coalition in the Middle East against Iran, and to have the at least the Sunni Arab world aligned with Israeli and U.S. European interests. I think I think that's that's the best you could hope for in in where we are today and American foreign policy. Uh, let's take a digression about Iran for just a minute. Um, some people say it's all religion, mm -hmm. including uh, comments uh, by uh, uh, Isaac uh, Herzog, the former president of Israel, who's a very thoughtful guy. But uh, other people say it's not, it's not religion. It's uh, oil. It's economics. It's money. It's power. It's everything but religion. And uh, these actors use religion as as a way to you know advance their other interests, um, they use religion and they use the you know historical hatred of the Arab community, the Palestinian community against Israel, as tools, as uh, you know, as weapons um, to aggravate things. Uh, what are your thoughts? Is it is what is it? Is it religion? Is it economics? Is it oil? Is it power? Um, is it geopolitical strategy? What is it? Yes, I think that, and that's why it's such a difficult problem. Because yes, it's all of those things, and and different people take different, put different foci on what we're talking about. So so some people would say it is about geopolitics, it is about oil. Other people will say it is about religion, and you know, and and then I think there's also an a, an ethnic and Arab element involved here. That that there's there's a there's an Arab versus Israeli mindset or Arab versus Jew mindset that that comes into play. So you know I think that it's it's it, that's what makes it so complicated is that there are all these dynamics and they all kind of feed into each other. And so and so that's why I tried to say that that the best outcome I think for the United States is to continue this process of trying to maintain some level of relationship with the the, the Sunni Arab world against. The, the Iranian, the Shiites era of world, because they see that as, as the, the best they can do in trying to maintain some level of stability in the Middle East, in the broader Middle East, which ultimately is beneficial to the Israelis and, and the maintenance of the Israeli state. Are you ruling out some kind of denouement with um, Iran itself? You know, the Iranian people, they're nice people. Uh... And they're, you know, they're largely middle-class people. They're pretty well educated. They're 
they, they, they as a group are sympathetic with the United States. It's just a theocracy that you know gets them off the track and and leads them down a, a path like this one. So, query: Are you ruling out the possibility that somebody, some strong leader, some really Akamai leader, could talk to them and make peace with them, and in so doing, create a peace for the whole region? A, a fair point, and I think that that could be a long-term solution. That that. You could you could you could eventually work with Iran, but I think as long as you have Hamas, Hezbollah, and and all the other influences by the Iranians in that region, I think that it, it's it's a bridge too far because you aren't going to remove the theocracy, and and Iran is at this point taking advantage of the situation, using using its relationship with China, using its relationship with with the Russians. To, to maintain its full of power in, in that region. Yeah, footnote, before we go forward to that, um, I just want to mention that, that recently, within the last day or two, uh, the Israelis released the footage that they accumulated uh, from the militants and otherwise of their killings of, of the, uh, the Israelis on October 7th. And what, what is interesting about this is that it wasn't just Hamas. Uh, it was the Islamic Jihad, and it was ordinary, old-fashioned Palestinians from, from Gaza. Uh, in other words, this, is a, this was a collaborative effort. And that's a shockeroo, because we have been led to think that the Palestinians are just human shields, uh, that Islamic uh, you know, uh, Jihad was a secondary organization, not, not, not right up at the front. Um, but no, this this footage shows you different. And so what we have is a is a collaboration between um, what did I say a lot a lot of a lot of groups. Yeah, I, I, I I'm I'm not quite as willing to walk all the way down that road. Uh, I mean, this is this is an real is an an Israeli interpretation of what they're seeing. And and to to I mean, I think we need to be very careful that we don't try to say. All Palestinians hate Israelis, and there's no. I mean, you just said. Well, they're not saying that, Carl. They're just saying there was some Palestinians involved in the attack. Right. Yeah. No, I understand that. But I mean, you know, the the next the next step is that is that we we can't have any sympathy for the Palestinians, and I think you know that's where the real difficulty comes. Is how do we how do we put this into context of what's happened in that part of the world? You know, I think that's and that's the and that's the part that becomes problematic when you start looking at, you know, to what extent is Israel Israel justified in in making retribution for what happened on October seventh. You know, and I think that that's that's where the Biden administration is trying to walk a really really thin rope to 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 figure out how do you balance human rights. You know. For, for the Palestinians who are, are caught in the middle. I agree, you know, that, that sure, there are some Palestinians who were engaged with Hamas in this, in this attack, but at some point you have to take into consideration the, the humanitarian aspect of what's happening in Gaza today. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of considerations there. There are linkages and then there are indications there were no linkages. And uh, it's really we'll never really know, at least not in the near term, anyway. Um, but let me let me ask you know what what Isaac Herzog said and what they all say, all the Israelis, they say, well, you know, just just release the hostages, and we'll we'll be much more humanitarian and and we'll we'll take it easy and um, we'll you know do do things uh, that are friendlier. I, I'm not sure what that would be. Uh, I guess they would stop bombing for one thing. But but who knows? Uh, but they say, you know, this is a logic thing. Uh, we don't get to any other question. We don't get to the question of what is what is Gaza going to look like after. We're not going to get there until we have the hostages back. Don't don't confuse us with future futuristic predictions and all that until we have the hostages back. Um, do you agree? Sure, I think we can say that 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 has to be that has to be part of the equation. But it can't be. I mean, realistically, it can't be. Give us the hostages, and then we'll show you what we're going to do. 
there that has to be that has to be a negotiation that has to be something that that who and who are you talking to i mean part of the problem here is that who who's the who's the other side you know are you are you going to talk to hamas well you can't really do that you know so so who who are you who are you talking to the israelis are are making a somewhat maximalist demand by saying hostages back then talk well okay who are you going to talk to are you going to talk to hamas because you said you want to eliminate hamas so now what what is the what is the authority you know the the the, the two state solution that that the united states blinken in particular are talking about of course brings in you know the plo uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization or the Palestinian Authority, but those people don't have credibility in Gaza right now either. So, so it really is problematic, and and I think that's why it's somewhat disingenu disingenuous for the Israelis to say, "Give us the hostages, and then we'll we'll be more humanitarian," because you you have no interlocutor to to make anything beyond the the demand. Uh, of, of returning the hostages. So they want, do you think they want an interlocutor? I mean, if you ask them in, you know, an, an honest one on one conversation, um, hey, don't you don't you want somebody from Hamas to talk to? Um, isn't that a part of a solution if you could just discuss it with some responsible official, if you will? I, I I don't understand. Are you are you saying? Do you, do you think is? Are you saying? Are you asking me if you if I think Israel wants an interlocutor or should want? Well, they should want one, yeah. But I'm not sure they do. As as part of the, and that I see I see that as part of the problem is you know when you start talking about a two state solution you know which is part of the formulation that 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 Blinken has been talking about with people and and Qatar is of course trying to push this again too. You know I mean. Who who are you gonna who's who's the other side? You know, there's really no authority that you're going to trust or you're going to want to talk to. And 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 I think I think the Israelis have been fairly clear that they're not going to accept Hamas as as the interlocutor at this point. Well, then you have to talk to yourself, don't you? Right. And uh, you know, so for example, um, and, uh, this is really questionable. Um, uh, Netanyahu gets up yesterday and he says, we're going to, we're going to occupy the place. This is a really highly charged word, not very good rhetoric at all. Yeah. We're going to occupy the place until it cools down. We are going to be the authority. We're going to talk to ourselves about how to do it. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to work it out in a way that it will work. And we know how to make that work. Um, a lot of people, a lot of pushback on that, even though the, the Israelis are united in the idea that they have to get rid of Hamas. Um, but this, what are you going to do later, day after analysis, is really important. So I asked you before, you know, what does peace look like? Um, what does peace look like in Gaza? Does it look like the Israelis will create a, a, a civil society there? They could. They could. Everybody would oppose that. I mean, the people in Hamas, or rather the, 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 the survivors of Hamas, and the Palestinians and the Gazans in general wouldn't feel too good about that. But as a practical matter, they could probably establish a democratic government in Gaza. Um, but short of that, short of that, and this is a hard question, Carl, I, if, I, if I were you, I would tell me that's too hard a question. <laughs> short of that, what can be done? Let's assume they get rid of Hamas. It's gone. The tunnels are all collapsed. You know, the weapons are all seized. Um, they have all the Hamas guys they can find in jail. Um, what what happens to Gaza? What do we want to happen? Well, I, um, what we want to happen and what and what Israel wants to happen, I think you're right, is not the same thing. And it should it probably shouldn't be the same thing. And I think you you have to think about it in terms of some some sort of collaborative effort by by the Arab world, or at least you know, I, ideally you would have a UN that could could move into this kind of situation. And I'm not sure that that's the case. So is there is there a regional force that you could bring in to to police Gaza or to to basically manage civil relations in Gaza post this this purge of the of the Hamas? 
you know, and I, I question, I mean, I very much question the premise that you can actually purge Hamas. It's sort of like the United States thinking they can purge the Taliban in, in Afghanistan. You know, I mean, and, and that we learned that lesson on a large scale. And I think that Israel will learn that you can't purge somebody on a small scale because by doing what you're doing now is you're building young Hamas's out there in, in Gaza that are going to remember you for generations for what, what you, they perceive as, as persecution. Uh, it actually couldn't be worse than it's been. You know, we have a, a generation or two or three of hatred and uh, how much worse could it get going forward? But okay, um, you know, you suggest, and maybe this is really a good takeaway for the show, you suggest some regional organization of Arab states, not, not including any, we don't include any terrorist organizations at all. In fact, we don't include any states that, are, that, that support terrorism, just ordinary Arab states around the region. And we make, and we make a kind of ASEAN out of it. Can I use that term? A kind of ASEAN out of it. And we say, look, you, will you guys get in a room and figure out what to do with, and we'll listen to you and hopefully the soul of the Palestinians in, in Gaza. You think that's a, a viable solution? And if so, how do you do that? Well, I mean, you do it, you do it by working with the Arab League. You do it by working with Qatar, you know, which once is very interested in trying to take a lead here. You know, I mean, the Saudis have kind of been uh, hinting that they're willing to work with Israel. You know, and so so maybe maybe that that the the Arab League uh, is is the uh, is is the place to start. You know, and 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 like as you say, you sort of isolate people who have have proven to be problematic, and and you you try to get the Palestinian Authority involved in any way, and and you know bring them in, and then at least you have somebody to talk to. You have somebody that there's at least a level of mutual trust to 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 work the streets of Gaza to to prevent the the exacerbation of the as you say generations of hatred. You know, to me, that's that that becomes uh, a a feasible solution. And then, of course, you need to address the issue of Palestinian homeland. You know, I mean, Martin Indyke, I think, is still correct in talking about some kind of trusteeship for for this this but, but wait but wait a palestinian homeland <clears throat> the palestinians already have gaza it's theirs it's been <laughs> theirs for 20 years yes um so what's the need to you know address uh, a palestinian homeland when they already have a homeland uh, well yeah uh yes that's correct uh, and and they they also have the West Bank, don't they? Is the West Bank inextricably linked to this whole affair in Gaza? I mean, it, Hamas is in both places, and Palestinians are in both places. I have to acknowledge that. But is it a necessary link in reaching peace in Gaza? Uh, oh, it's cer well, certainly what is what is necessary for peace in Gaza is is some recognition that. The Palestinians and the Israelis have a disagreement over territorial rights on that piece of land, whatever you want to call that piece of geography. The fact is, is that yes, the Palestinians have Gaza and they have the West Bank, but you and I both know that there's way more baggage associated with those statements than what I just said. Mm. The other thing is, um, uh, this is something Isaac Herzog also said, I found it. Um, I found it really interesting, and I've heard it before. You know, back in the day, in the aught years, if you will, um, there were a lot of countries, uh, not necessarily from, uh, you know, th that region, but uh, from Europe, who gave uh, the Palestinians a lot of money in Gaza and said, here, go make, and I'm my quoting on this, go make a, a beautiful city. Go make a city with tourism and wonderful hotels and restaurants. This, this Singapore, I think they called it the Singapore of the Mediterranean. What a great idea. And they gave them enough money to build the infrastructure for this. Uh, but when Hamas took over, and I mean took over, um, they built tunnels instead. They spent billions on, on these ridiculous tunnels um, and weapons. And so that that got lost, 
But in, in the new piece, Carl, don't you think it would be a good idea to revisit that, I, that idea about redeveloping Gaza with hotels and, and five-star restaurants and tourism all along the shore and make it the Singapore, you know, of, of the Mediterranean? So, A, could it be done? B, who would help do it? Because it's going to cost billions, you know, just like Ukraine is going to cost billions. Um, and um, and um, could, is it doable at all? Would it work? Well, I mean, I, I think the, the money is there. Certainly the Gulf states are, are, not, are not short of cash. I mean, they've, uh, they've certainly spent a lot of money on sports teams of late. And so that money could probably be repurposed. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so yeah, I, think, I think that's, that's all doable. But again, you really, you really need to have, you know, the, the next step in what we were trying to do with the, with the Gulf states and, and the Abram Accords. You know, I think that that's, that's really, you know, that, that, that's why I said, I think build a stronger Middle East coalition absent the Iranians. Now, granted, you know, maybe 20 years from now, we can talk about somehow remembering that the Iranian people are good people and that they're run by a theocracy, which is, uh, has run itself out of, out of power. But for now, I think that, that we really need to figure out how to, how to engage the Arab world in, in helping solve this problem. And, and Israel saying all Palestinians are bad and Palestinians saying all Israelis are bad is not part of that solution. That you know that it's that's a problem that needs to be addressed of of you know reducing the level of of animosity and the maximalist demands from both sides need to be need to be dialed back a bit before you're going to get real buy-in from from the Arabs. I think. Yeah, it's going to take a long time for Israel. Um, you know that this was so brutal, so so outlandish, outrageous. Uh, but anyway, um, what, you know, one of the essential elements of building that coalition is not only to include, like the Arab League, certain reasonable countries, but it's making sure that you exclude the others. Mm -hmm. And so I want to, uh, obviously, Iran is not a good candidate right now. Um, I don't think Syria is. I don't think Yemen is for many reasons, including the fact that it's all fragmented and involved in a perpetual war. Um, but then, you know, there's Lebanon, which Lebanon is the, is the poor boy, the poor person of that whole area. Lebanon is falling apart, um, economically falling apart, and that leads to falling apart politically, which is why Hezbollah has such authority. And, um, you know, Iran has such authority in, in Lebanon because it's falling apart. So well, and, and, and Syria, Syria the same way. I mean, I, as you say, I mean, those two are just not real candidates. I mean, maybe the interesting one is Jordan. You know, yes. how do they how do they fit in since they're so much different? They're not really part of the Arab Arab League or anything. And so you know, so if, if you could bring in, you could bring in Jordan and 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 the Arabs and and the Israelis to come up with some some sort of. Uh, governance mechanism in Gaza that they can all at least accept and at least negotiate with. I think that that's, that's the, the best we can hope for in, in the, at least the midterm. So I want to ask about other countries. Uh, Saudis, the Saudis sound like a good candidate. Um, they have the money and they can be reasonable most of the time. Uh, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, Emirates, are those good candidates? Yeah, I think those I think those are the prime candidates because those are the ones that have the money, they have the they have the resources, they have they have enough goodwill on both sides that they could play that and they and they are are they're certainly not real democracies, but they certainly have have good relations with with the United States, with with the the Palestinians, at least they're they're the Palestinians think they're friends, you know, so, and, and the Israelis have been obviously, you know, through the United States working to establish these relationships with these countries. So, yeah, I think, and those are the ones with the money. I mean, let's be, let's be honest here. You know, when you, when you put gutter, Bahrain and the UAE in a room, they've got a lot of, they've got a lot of cash that's available. So they, they do have the money to, to, to find what's it. in it for them. A more stable region. I mean, they 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 get a benefit from that too. That they they actually are are hurt 
by the by the the Palestinian issue or the you know the Israeli issue, depending on what side you're sitting on, I suppose. You know, but I think they they would benefit from that. They would get certainly get prestige for it. You know, and and they're they are looking for that. I mean, this is part of that uh, you know part of that effort to to reach out to the West and and insulate themselves a little bit at least from from Chinese influence and from Russian influence. Right. You know, they, they, want, they, don't their... wanna, they don't want to get sucked up into that into that vortex very much either. Well, I mean, and they 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 want to control the crowds in the street because uh, that you know the crowds in the street are a symbol of um, uh, volatility and and un instability. What about Egypt? Would you include or exclude Egypt? I mean, I think Egypt has to be included, you know, given given its history with with the with the uh, Israelis and and uh, the, the Gaza and you know, obviously they're they're the, they're the neighbor that has to has to work to to facilitate what's happening in Gaza. So yeah, I think I think Egypt has to be included as well. These questions get harder as we go forward. Carl. I know. <laughs> Stop. I, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you about, about Pakistan. I'm not going to even ask about that. But, yeah, no, but I, I, think, I think we can stop somewhere over on that side. <laughs> what about what about Europe? What about the EU? I, I guess, I, sure. I mean, the EU has to has to be supported. But I think, you know, I think if there's you know, it's not it's not an EU America problem. It's it's the the global South. I know people are Joe Nye says I can't use that term anymore because it's it's not well defined. Now, that's a little bit disingenuous. It's defined well enough. We know who they are. You may not have a have a country name for each one of them, but the fact is is that there's a there's that that rest of the world out there that is looking very much for real leadership, and I think that that's. That's the, the group that we need to impress that we can do something useful and, and collaboratively. And so I think certainly Europe is, is part of it. And I think Europe wants to be a part of it, even though they're also part of that problem that goes back to, to the, mid, the, mid, the interwar years of, of the 20s and 30s. There's so few of them. I mean, interwar years. Yeah. <laughs> But now the most ticklish one of all is the United States, because what we do is not necessarily trusted in the Arab world, um, but what we do is, or theoretically, can be very, very influential. It can be influential, uh, certainly with, uh, with Israel, because uh, we support Israel in, in so many ways, and there's a, you know, a historical nexus for sure. Um, and I suppose, uh, we, you know, it can be influential in, in at least some of these countries that we've identified as part of the coalition. Mm -hmm. But 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 the U.S. Is, is sort of in a fragile spot because it may be treated with distrust by some of those countries and by the Palestinians. Uh, it may be treated as too influential, you know, maybe by the Israelis. Um, and, of course, the U.S., you alluded to this earlier, is is not the same as it was. It is no longer the, you know, the the, the beacon on the hill. It is no. It, it doesn't have moral supremacy that it used to have. Sorry, um, and um, and then of course we're in the middle of a of a campaign that will determine our future, um, and it may not be the right kind of future for a country that wants to make peace in the Middle East. So what, what now? This is a big question of all, Carl. Mm -hmm. This is what our title is: How can America make peace in the Middle East? Uh, yeah, can America make peace in the little in the Middle East. Yeah, I think I think we just defined what my answer is. I mean, in some ways, we we we've, we've sort of given you that answer because it's the fact that the United States doesn't have uni, uni, unipolar influence anymore, and it needs to learn to play with others. And by that, I mean, you need to figure out how to get the Arabs on board. You need to figure out how to get the Europeans to contribute meaningfully to the, to the process. And you need to figure out how to get the Egyptians to, to contribute and whoever else is willing to contribute. You know, and it's not, it's not gonna be through the UN. That's not going to be the solution because you've got, you've got basically a stalemated security council again. So you've got, to, you've got to show that you can actually lead from the middle rather than lead by saying, we're going to do this, follow me. You know, I think that that's, that's the real challenge for the United States. Are they really prepared to acknowledge 
that they are a a player, not the player in providing peace. So when it says U.S., we say we want to say U.S. and its friends and partners and mean it beyond U.S. U.S. partners and allies, U.S. first, and everybody else just kind of tag along. I think that that's that's where we are today. And I think that this is sort of a microcosm of that larger problem that we have in the world that we need to really think about how do we work collaboratively with, with our friends and partners and allies and partners to provide public goods uh, and a public good. And the public good today is to prevent total chaos in, in Israel and, and that part of the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good point, Carl. Really, that is really a, a real takeaway from this discussion. Uh, on the other hand, whatever the United States, whatever the role the United States finds to be appropriate as the person in the middle, the, the nation in the middle, um, it has to be, don't you agree, it has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. It can't jump from election uh, cycle to election cycle, on again, off again, and and everybody in the world watches what happens for for every bloody committee in both houses of Congress, never knowing what we're going to do or not do. We, I think we we have to find a consistency. Is this possible? That's not a fair question. <laughs> okay, I withdraw that question. <laughs> the answer is too obvious, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, 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 and I think, I think the rest of the world sees that. I mean, you're exactly right that that the rest of the world worries. You know, how, how, how can the United States continue to to play a meaningful role when you have what appears to be complete chaos in Washington D.C. You know, and, and so I think, you know, it's it's again, it's it's another yet another not yet another call from the wild out there saying. It's it's time to to understand that this is this is costing uh, the Ameri the, the United States a a role in the world. It's it's a a challenge to American if if you want soft power. You know that 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 sense that the United States is is a a beacon is is sort of gone. And and now we really need to see if we can get a little fire started here to show that we we do have some capacity. To, to build a coalition that, that involves everybody and gives everybody a role to play in, in resolving big issues. Yeah, oh yeah, it reminds me of a, my summer camp when I was a kid. The counselor didn't tell us what to do. He asked us what we wanted to do. And we, and we thought, silly us, that it was our decision. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's something, something out of Buck Finn. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, um, yeah, so let, let's talk about the immediate issue, and that is uh, whether the United States uh, goes ahead and uh, supports, um, you know, Israel with money and weapons. Uh, this is not entirely clear yet. And the poison pill of defunding the IRS is, you know, doesn't help it uh, at all. Um, and, and of course, uh, defunding the entire government as a threat between now and next week doesn't help it at all. I mean, all the world is watching. So that's one part of my question. The other part is, uh, you know, the whole Ukrainian thing, mm -hmm. where for some reason, there are those who like Israel with the poison pill, um, but don't like Ukraine, where in fact, it, it, there's a lot of similarity between a wrongful, immoral attack and, uh, and, the, and the fate of a nation in both cases. And yet we, we make the, the distinction without any real difference, um, or we seem to be making the distinction without a difference between Israel and Ukraine. So how does this play in terms of the United States, United States finding a foreign policy role that would be appropriate in the middle, end quote, um, to play um, you know, a, a better strategy in the Middle East? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to answer your question because you know, Ukraine and, and Israel are connected, but they're not connected the way that we're trying to portray them. I, I don't think I don't think we're defending democracy here. I, I don't see that as as the, the, the common element. 
you know, as as Biden has said, you know, that these are these are two democracies under threat. I, I think that that that's that's just misleading. I think you know, I, I, Iraq, uh, Iraq, Israel is is not under the democracy in Israel is not under threat because of this war. I think that that Israel is is an issue that needs to be dealt with because it it is a problem that is has been going on for a long time and it and it deserves attention. I think Ukraine is is a problem that needs to be addressed separately from Israel. I don't think I don't think it's it's useful to connect them. I think they both need to be supported, but I I, I don't like the idea of connecting them. I think that that misleads and it and it leads to uh, to a very difficult position for the United States because people see it as a double standard. In, in you know, as you know, in 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 the the global south, if you will, they see what's happening in Palestine as an example of, or in Gaza, I'm sorry, in Gaza as a a smaller version of what Russia did in Ukraine. You know, and so so I think we need to be very careful that we we the United States recognize that that there is this perception, and so by 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 linking them, it becomes even more difficult to to maintain that that Iraq, uh, Israel is doing one thing in I Israel and we need to defend the Israel's right to self-defense, where in, in Ukraine, it really is about an invasion of, of a, a sovereign country. You know, that raises, at least in my mind right now, right here, um, one possible reason that Joe Biden put him together. Because I, I, with you, I was surprised that he put him together that way and made it one one initiative. Uh, I thought two initiatives might have been more thoughtful. Um, but I think I think what he might have had on his mind, maybe what he said, was um, these are both exigent situations. Um, these are both time of the essence kinds of support. We have delayed too long in this, and we, we need to act now, or history will take take a pass. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean that's being pretty generous. I think. Uh, I mean, I, what I what I heard him say was that this is this is a threat to democracy uh, argument, and so I, I you know, I, I mean, yes, they are both existential threats, but I think that they're they're fundamentally different existential threats. So I'll I'll go with I'll go with existential. Okay. Okay, I've been asking people, you know, and, and to get all kinds of different answers about whether the success of these two countries, Israel and Ukraine, uh, have a profound effect, or what level of effect do they have on the election in November? If Joe Biden, you know, purports to uh, support them both, but fails simply by the passage of time or politics, what have you, and they both, you know, lose in some notable way, or either one of them loses in some notable way, isn't that going to make him look like a, a um, you know, a weak president, a weak international leader, which he does not want to look like that? Uh, and will it cost him, you know, um, lots of votes in the election? Honestly, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with the, with the sort of standard answer of saying, it's very unusual that foreign policy has an impact on American elections, and I think in this case that would also be true. I mean, it would be it would be something that the Republicans could pile on. Uh, well, sure, like standard. Afghanistan. Remember Afghanistan? You know? Yeah, yeah, sort of, but that's kind of a vague memory already. <laughs> uh, I, mean, yeah, I mean, for you know, for for the way the way the Americans treat it, you know, I mean, it, it, it's really hard to see how how foreign, like I say. The, the Republicans could pile that on to 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 the the deficit list for for Biden, but I mean, there's so many other things, you know, the economy, and you know, are you better off this year than you were four years ago? Kind of kind of arguments about the economy, and so yeah, yeah it could be, but you know, I mean, if, at the at the risk of thinking that I understand people who are voting for the Republican candidate uh, in 2024, the, the or the presumptive. 2024 candidate. I Whose mean, name should not be mentioned. Yeah, that's right. I'm not. <laughs> uh, you know, you have to. You have to wonder uh, how 
much they care about anything beyond uh, the border with Mexico. Yeah, not true. Okay, one last one last area, one last question. So the U.S. has um, and Joe Biden have uh, tried to um, uh, convince Netanyahu um, and Israel to, you know, not attack or to attack in lesser measure or to take a pause, whatever that means. We could spend a, a whole show on that. Uh, um, and and so what, what you have is um, he's trying, and Anthony Blinken is trying uh, to get Israel to back off, to get Net Netanyahu to back off a little bit, uh, but they're not really successful. And there's good reasons for Israel to say, no, we're not gonna buy that, this is our war, you stay out of it. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm wondering about your reaction to that. Uh, should they have asked that? Should they have insisted that um, that Netanyahu back off? Um, uh, should they insist more? Should they be more insistent? Where, where, where does that role that we were talking about fit in dealing with their relations with Netanyahu right now? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I saw in the news today that, that apparently Netanyahu has agreed to stop fighting for four hours at a at strategic times or something to allow movement of, of refugees and and uh, provide humanitarian aid or something. So, you know, so so they're 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 inching in that direction, apparently, of, of providing something, you know, this humanitarian pause, whatever, you know, kind of a disingenuous term, I think. But you know, yes, I think I think there has to be again. There has to be if you if you're going to find a solution in the end. I think you've got to show some empathy for refugees for for people who are caught in the middle of this thing. And the only way you're going to do that, uh, based on what you see happening in the rest of the world, specifically in the in the you know again in the global south, that you've got to show that you have some empathy for the the citizens of Gaza. You know the, the the normal people of Gaza, and if you can't do that, then then it becomes even more difficult to see how you can play a role in in putting things back together once whatever we're doing in Gaza is is over, or whatever the Israelis are doing in Gaza is over. If you're going to be a part of that solution, then I think you've got to at least be somewhat responsive to to the demands of the rest of the world that is supporting the Palestinian. Uh, position. Yeah, but what about uh, Biden himself? Should he be more insistent? Should he, you know he has a lot of leverage with Netanyahu? Um, should he be mm, really pushing him? Yes, I do. I think I think that he, I think he should. I think that that he should be pushing for. I, I personally think we should be be looking at at least a a temporary ceasefire. I'm not saying a, a permanent ceasefire, but certainly certainly time to to recalibrate what we're trying to do and 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 you know again you're not going to eliminate every every member of hamas no matter how many times you spend out no matter how much time you spend down in the tunnels you're not going to eliminate you're not going to eradicate people who hate israel living in in gaza it's just not going to happen mm. so yes i think i think we should he should be more more proactive but i understand why he's not also yeah I mean, he's, um, he's li literally trying to walk a rope. Yes, I, I, I'm, that's really what's happening here. He's got two sides yelling at him, mm -hmm. and he's got to find a way. And and for that matter, Netanyahu has got to find a way. So he's talking about a pause of a few hours. Uh, the answer is in between, um, yeah. more than a few hours, but less than a few days, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, let me ask you. Pick, pick a time frame, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so that Netanyahu is not too worried about, for example, um, uh, Hamas building up its uh, building up its forces again and planting more booby traps or whatever. Um, he wants to. He should want to give him only enough time to do the humanitarian thing, and after that, let's get back to business. Um, anyway, let me let me. Uh, well, I'm, I'm much more. I'm much more. I'm much more of a of a, a peacemonger. Than, than than that. I mean, I would I would say I, re, I I mean personally I would I would say you really need to reevaluate what your objective is here. Is is it really to 
to to destroy in detail or is it to send a clear message and then start working with people who can actually help solve the problem because mm. you, yeah i mean i'm, I'm going to say you're not, you can't kill your way to victory now golda Meir said you can't make peace with somebody who is sworn to destroy you that's what yeah. golda Meir said so and and what, what what did i hear one more very interesting comment with reference to um you know the second world war is uh, uh the way to peace is through war. Yeah. And that uh, seems remember. to play out again and again. Yeah, but I'm I'm gonna yeah, I know peace is our profession. So <laughs> look out for that bomb. So one last question, and it, it goes to Thomas Friedman's uh column in, in today's Times, where he said, uh, the one magic bullet here is to get rid of Netanyahu, get him out of office, <laughs> and then we'll all be able to relax. Because he's a terrible leader, and, and indeed, a lot of people feel that he is a, a terrible leader. Maybe less so of a wartime leader, but his rhetoric really needs some work. Uh, if you and I got in a room with him, we could really help him. I know that. Um, but uh, the problem is that uh, he's already cast he's cast his lot in terms of the way he addresses these issues and the words he chooses and so forth. So, you know, uh, that's what Friedman is coming from that point of view. We can't we can't have Netanyahu there any longer, um, and if we do, you know, change change Netanyahu out. Uh, there's the you know the issue of looking weak. There's the issue of having more of the same kind of tumult in Israel, which democracies have that we know, but that kind of tumult doesn't help them in in prosecuting any of these other external issues. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about whether we sh we should encourage Netanyahu to step down. We should encourage Israel to mm, force him to step down. And if so, what? How do we do that in a way that that it doesn't uh, have a, a deleterious effect? I mean, I, it probably would have been a, a something that you could think about doing a year ago. <laughs> I, I, I'm right now it, it, that, that you you sim I don't think there's a, a reasonable way to do that uh, other than to 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 cause him to lose so much face and and it would really kind of destroy uh, Israel's capacity to to respond at this point. So I think I think yes, it would be nice to figure out how to how to get Netanyahu to move on. Uh, but uh, I, I don't see any any reasonable way for the for the United States to, you know, make threats or or to, you know, sort of position itself to to make that happen outside of the normal confines of Israel Israeli politics. Yeah, regime change is always troublesome when you're trying to do it as a matter of foreign policy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's trickier than you might have thought. <laughs> You know, it's it's great to think about how they're going to throw roses at your feet when you come through the streets, but uh, it doesn't always work out that way now, does it? Carl, I so much uh, appreciate your your good nature and your, and your engagement with me on these all these all these issues. We've covered so much, and I I really appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs>